The only casualty was the severely wounded tanker. Had we not been forced to recover Gruber's tank, he might have been spared. The Russians attempted a new strategy, launching an operation from the sea, dubbed Operation Sea Lion, targeting the coast near Merakila. We moved a few tanks to the coast, but most landing craft had already been destroyed at sea by the pack guns of the Feldherrnhalle division. When we arrived, we saw only burning boats on the water. A few Russians made it to shore but were soon captured. They were elite troops, well equipped and indicating that the operation had been meticulously planned, intended to coincide with a breakthrough in the East Sack. However, despite the failure of their ground offensive, the Russians launched the landing anyway, resulting in a senseless loss of life. The spectre of Operation Sea Lion haunted us for a long time, especially at night, but there were no further attempts during our time in the Nawa sector. By the end of March, our tanks were withdrawn from the 61st Infantry Division sector to prepare for a new operation. The elimination of the East Sack and the West Sack, led by Oberst Graf Strachwitz. At our support base on the Baltic coast, we finally had a few days to recover, which was essential for the crews of our three tanks. During the previous operations, they hadn't received any rest, day or night. Despite our resilience, individual limits exist. Our rest period was interesting and relaxing. I especially enjoyed listening to good music on the radio, leading to small disagreements with the commander, who preferred modern and easy listening. I also made a four-legged friend, Hasso, a German shepherd that von Schiller had acquired from military police for a bottle of schnapps. Hasso was well trained and brought me joy. He would fetch things from the strong currents of the Baltic and was obedient to commands. He accompanied me everywhere and kept me company at night. Although he was a company dog, he was particularly attached to me and remembered his training well. However, my happiness didn't go unchallenged. The commander seemed somewhat envious of my rapport with the men, failing to recognise that my success came with significant hardships. He was surprised at our hunter's luck, oblivious to the reality that I was always in action while he wasn't. In Silama, the mood was often tense. I frequently engaged with the men, which did not sit well with the commander, who believed in maintaining distance. I faced challenges from both sides, calming the NCOs when they complained about the commander and reassuring the CO that our men were reliable. One day, during an artillery barrage from the Russians, the situation escalated. The enemy was relentless, firing over us and into the sea with long-range artillery. Their rounds would frequently pass over our heads, creating an unsettling atmosphere. A standing order required everyone to rush into the cellar during an artillery barrage, which was justified given that a maintenance sergeant and a company clerk had been killed by shrapnel when caught outside. The commander, however, was often the first to jump to safety, much to the NCO's dismay, who felt that a leader should prioritise the safety of his men. The company commo sergeant, Funkmeister Schottroff, an otherwise quiet, dependable man and exemplary soldier, lost his nerves, insulted von Schiller in Bunker 99, and almost became physical. He had to be taken into custody for mutiny. Von Schiller insisted that I immediately accompany him to the court-martial authority. We had to attend a meeting with the commander of the Grub Deutschland Panzer Regiment, Oberst Graf Strachwitz. During the ride, I urged von Schiller not to destroy the life of a proven soldier like Schotroff. Eventually, I reached a point where he became indecisive. Perhaps he also considered that things said at a court-martial could be unpleasant for him. To my great relief, he didn't exit at the court-martial site. Instead, he turned to me and said, OK, Otto, I've thought it over. Because of you, I want to personally punish Skotroff's unbelievable behaviour. I will arrest him and then take him into combat with me. I remained quiet. A great burden was lifted from my shoulders. Funkmeister Schotroff thus received the most severe punishment a company commander could mandate, confinement to quarters. He then had to serve as the radio operator in the commander's tank during the next few operations. This punishment was psychologically misleading. First, assignment to the line elements could not be a punishment. It was expected from all of us. Notably, Schotroff had frequently requested permission to participate in operations, but had always been denied because his position was hard to replace. 
Von Schiller would soon find that he would never have been allowed to take Schotteroff along in his tank. Oberst der Reserve, Hyacinth Graf Strachwitz, was a man who, once encountered, was never forgotten. The Graf was a master of organisation, delegating improvisation to his subordinates. We were fortunate to participate in several operations under his command, which exemplified that well-planned endeavours are already halfway to success. Graf Strachwitz received the Knight's Cross as a Major der Reserve and commander of the 1st Battalion of Panzer Regiment II on August 25, 1941. He received the Oak Leaves on November 17, 1942, and the Swords on March 28, 1943, as an Oberst and commander of the Panzer Regiment of the Gross S. Deutschland Division. For his contributions to the success of the upcoming operation, he was recognised with the Diamonds on March 15, 1944. Gossip suggested that the Gross S. Deutschland Panzer Regiment was taken from Strachwitz due to excessive losses. I had doubts about this claim. He and his staff were consistently deployed to critical front lines, where support was maximised, and painful losses were sometimes unavoidable. Yet, these losses often saved the lives of soldiers from other units. Graf Strachwitz brought his staff from Grosses Deutschland, along with a few tanks and armoured personnel carriers. Our company played a subordinate role in the first operation, aimed at cutting off and eliminating the West Sack. The attack progressed from west to east near the sole of the boot, re-establishing contact with the infantrymen in the boot. A line was established, and the pocket was ultimately eliminated. The trail used was not wide or firm enough for our tigers, so we had to rely on the lighter Panzer the Fours brought along by the Graf. For this operation, we were only responsible for holding back the pressure in other areas of the West Sack due to the attack. The operation was supposed to be supported by Stukas, but they proved ineffective in the dense forest terrain, often endangering our own troops. The pilots struggled to identify their targets. Ju 87S arrived on time, but one bomb landed directly on the only trail our attacking tanks could use, almost hitting Graf Strachwitz himself. He cursed profusely, forcing the infantry to carry on without armour support. It was crucial to establish the line before nightfall to prevent the Russians from escaping or rolling up our own line. Strachwitz managed to reach his objective without tanks or stukas. The next day the pocket was reduced and eliminated, resulting in the capture of most Russians and their equipment. Only a few escaped south during the night, as Ivan initiated relief attacks. This setback led our enemy to reinforce the East Sack, with more troops and materials than before. The Graf had his quirks, but his respect and recognition were undeniable. For instance, he refused to be addressed as Herr Oberst, those who knew him as a major noted that he was not shy about asserting that being a Graf held more significance than military rank. During the initial briefing, he clearly outlined his vision for the operation. His bold planning surprised us, but it quickly made sense. Well, gentlemen, this is how I see things, he said in a somewhat haughty manner. Our Kampfgruppe will conduct a frontal attack against the so-called East Sack. Starting at the Kinderheim, it will move across the plain to the rail crossing. Four Tigers will drive point. After crossing the railway embankment, they will swing to the right and roll it up. The following four Tigers, with a squad of infantry mounted on each, will drive quickly to the fork in the road, which is 100 metres southeast of the rail crossing. This fork must be reached as quickly as possible and kept open for the four Panzer the Fours and the APCs to advance and occupy the plain, which aligns with the bottom of the pocket. He pointed to the map. That takes care of that. At night, a perimeter will be set up and held until another infantry regiment can follow and establish the front line. Contact will then be made to the west and east. The main thing I want to emphasise is that the entire operation must run according to schedule. No tank may remain on the road and block me. The success of the entire action may be jeopardised through delay, and I won't allow that. I expressly order that every immobile tank be shoved into the marsh by any means necessary so it doesn't impede other vehicles. The responsibility for the success of the operation lies squarely on the tank commander, regardless of rank. Is everything clear? 
Jawohl, Herr Graf. The Oberst twisted his mouth into a slightly sarcastic smile, aware that we had made a few remarks about his desired form of address. Very well. So far it's all been quite simple. But now a different question for the Tiger people. What battalion do you want to fight with? We looked at each other, astonished by this generous offer, and quickly agreed upon a light infantry battalion we had previously worked with. Very well, that's what you'll have. The Oberst turned to his adjutant. Make sure these people are extracted from the front at Nawa and brought here. We'll discuss the employment of flamethrowers, engineers, artillery observers and other details later. The air superiority in the sector will be ensured by fighters. This has already been arranged. You will maintain necessary radio contact with the Stukas via a liaison APC. Anything else? Oh yes. You will receive your own maps and aerial photos for the operation, specially prepared for this mission. Important areas have been marked by numbers to avoid misunderstandings and facilitate quick location reporting. That's all for today. Any questions? No? Good then. Thank you, gentlemen. A new mine-clearing device for tanks was ordered by air a few days before the attack scheduled for April 6th. This heavy roller was designed to be pushed ahead of the tank to detonate mines before the vehicle passed over them. However, it slowed the tank's advance too much, and we refused to use it, despite the risk of mines. Operation Strachwitz was practised twice far behind the front in an area resembling the East Sack. This was done without Luftwaffe or artillery, but with live ammunition. The Supreme Commander of the Northern Front was present, and emphasised the operation's importance. Holding the bridgehead in Nawa was crucial due to the oil shale deposits in Estonia, urgently needed for our V-boat support points. At that time, we didn't consider why Estonian oil was so vital to the German war effort. We were entirely focused on the mission ahead. Shortly before the attack began, we rolled into our assembly areas behind the high ground of the Kinderheim, we had to be extremely careful to avoid noise to prevent drawing Russian attention. As usual, artillery fired occasional rounds for background noise. The Graf had thought of everything. The infantry was already there, and every squad quickly found its tank since we knew each other well from training. Everything proceeded like clockwork. Our four Tigers drove in this order. Kirscher, me, Zweti and Gruber. The Graf had expressly forbidden the unit leader from being first in line to prevent delays if the lead tank hit a mine. Thus, contrary to my usual practice, I had to ride second this time, despite the fact that one could only fully assess the situation from the lead vehicle. The Tigers naturally led the way. Because of our prior assignments in the area, we were familiar with Lembitu. Every bomb crater was known to us, and we had even glimpsed behind the rail embankment. The three tank commanders around me represented the ideal type of tank commander, a rarity. Over the preceding months, I had experienced nearly every operation with these comrades, and I hope I can mention them here without diminishing the value of other commanders like Link, Weasley, Carpanetto, Goering, Riel, Meyer and Hermann. The latter group had simply had less luck with their tanks, often borrowing another vehicle and thus not standing out as much. In essence, they were all equal, and I hope every future tank company commander has men of their calibre. Our lead group didn't have any mounted infantry. Gruber and Zweti each had three combat engineers as guests, meant to assist if mines were encountered. It's worth noting that nothing happened to these engineers during the operation. Whenever we stopped, they quickly made themselves scarce in the surrounding terrain, enjoying a better experience than we did in our tanks. Graf Strachwitz had two bunkers constructed at the Kinderheim, one for him and another for his adjutant. This meticulous Graf had truly thought of everything. During the attack, infantrymen could move better without winter clothing, so their gear was collected and bundled by squad, marked for delivery by an APC after the objective was secured to prevent freezing. In the days leading up to the attack, the commander's aide determined the exact time of day when it was light enough to see and shoot properly. The attack's timing was based on this calculation. The preparatory fire was to start five minutes before the attack and shift after another five. By the end of the first five minutes, we were expected to have crossed the rail embankment. Just before the attack began, 
The Graf came to observe the breakthrough from our position, carrying his traditional thin walking stick. We then experienced an unprecedented barrage of fire. 37mm rapid-fire flak guns, 20mm quads, and 88mm flak guns formed a semicircle around the east sack, firing with tracers that created a dome of fire for us to drive under. A rocket regiment from farther back launched napalm rockets, followed by high-explosive munitions, producing devastating effects. The low-hanging woods in the marshes prevented pressure from escaping upward, scorching the trees to several metres high. All Russians not in bunkers were killed by the blast. Concurrently, howitzer and artillery units, including 280mm howitzers, unleashed everything they had. During this barrage, we rolled toward the rail crossing at high speed. From the left ruins, we saw Russians fleeing back to their trenches. Our machine gun fire was ineffective while on the move. In an instant, we were over the rail crossing, which was unmined as expected, since Ivan needed that road for his supplies. Our attack must have caught the Russians completely off guard. After passing the crossing and turning right, we saw a Russian standing frozen in his shirt and pants unable to believe we had arrived. Kersher took out an anti-tank gun that hadn't been readied, finishing it off before the crew could react. We then drove parallel to the rail embankment heading west. The plain between the railroad and the wood line was mined, necessitating careful navigation in each other's tracks. Fortunately, the mines were laid on the surface due to frost, and the Russians hadn't dug in deeply because of the marshy terrain. We managed to take our intermediate objective without any losses, then turned right to attack Russian positions from behind. The Russians had built bunkers into the rail embankment, which now provided little protection. Seven anti-tank guns that the surprised enemy hadn't turned around were quickly neutralised. We were in high spirits because our breakthrough, which was crucial for the operation's success, had exceeded expectations. The exceptional planning was starting to pay off. Our good mood was disturbed rather abruptly, however, by a very unpleasant interruption. It was at this point that we suddenly started to receive heavy fire from our own 150mm infantry howitzers, which were being directed from the Kinderheim. The observer thought we were enemy tanks. Our silhouette barely peeked over the railway embankment, and we were shooting in the direction of our own lines. We received a demonstration of how unpleasant the fire of these guns was. We heard every report quite distinctly, and also saw the heavy rounds, which had a very flat trajectory, come straight at us. That certainly wasn't anything for weak nerves. We were forced to drive back and forth across the mine-infested terrain to avoid the unfriendly messengers. One might call something like that a continual change of position. But who would want a 150mm round landing on his head? On top of everything else, our folks were shooting very well. Of course, I immediately radioed the observer at the Kinderheim to explain the mistake. It became more and more uncomfortable because our people were continuing to fire all four guns unabated. Nothing else was left for me to do but fire a few rounds in front of the observer. That forced him to change positions, and we cleared out before he could again begin to become uncomfortable for us. I later took the guy to task. He really hadn't recognised us and simply did not want to believe that we had driven behind the embankment so quickly. Not until our unexpected fire did he become nonplussed. He then straightened out the matter. The friendly fire had additional unpleasant consequences. We had got through it all unscathed, to be sure, but the tense concentration and the continual driving back and forth had diverted our attention. So much so that we didn't notice an anti-tank gun, which had gone into position in the woods behind us. We were then startled in a most disagreeable fashion. I was hit in the rear. Zweti found the guy and covered the wood line to avoid further surprises. Almost at the same time, they hit Gruber from the right. Ivan had quickly turned around an anti-tank gun, which was in a small copse of trees near the rail crossing. It had not been spotted by us, and it knocked out Gruber. The first shot severely damaged the running gear. The second round penetrated. In the process, Gruber and the loader were wounded. First, we silenced the anti-tank gun. Then Zweti shepherded the tank out of the minefield in the direction of the rail crossing. 
It could drive under its own power only with great difficulty. Zweti covered him and brought him back to the Kinderheim. The good fortune in our misfortune was that Gruber's tank did not need to be towed, because all hell was breaking loose in our area. Even the Russian heavy artillery south of Nawa had joined the battle. Ivan wanted to turn the tide around at all costs. We couldn't be concerned with the rest of the Russian infantry because we had to follow the advance guard. It had long since passed the fork in the road at the rail crossing. Von Schiller held open the entrance to the marshy woods with his four vehicles and the accompanying infantry. Unfortunately, the light infantry battalion had heavy casualties due to Russian artillery. The infantry had jumped into the ditch after reaching the fork in the road to look for cover. After the Russians realised that we had broken through to the south, they fired at precisely this spot with artillery and mortars. One round landed right in the middle of our infantry. Because the men were lying quite close together, the losses were very heavy. They should have dispersed themselves immediately. As we drove south through the woods, Ivan was on guard everywhere. We had to pay excruciating attention to avoid new unpleasant surprises. We saw mortars in position to the left and right in the woods. Next to them were infantry howitzers and anti-tank guns. We had only one goal, forward at all costs. We were thus only able to deal with those Russian guns aimed directly at us while driving by. In front of the woods, we came across a cemetery that the Russians had set up for their dead. They always buried their dead right behind the front. When the pocket was mopped up later, we found out that the wooden crosses didn't even have names on them. An incident proved how much our operation was also dependent upon chance. In addition to carefulness and bravery, a soldier needs a bit of luck, more so than someone in civilian life. A T-34 suddenly surfaced out of a cut in the woods to the side. It was driving south along our trail. Of course, it had no intention of attacking. It just wanted to escape to the south. We, on the other hand, weren't going to knock it out, because it then would have blocked the all-important and only way for us. So for once, our intentions were the same. Too much time would have been lost by the time the engineers had blown the tank out of the way, and I don't believe that our operation would have ended successfully. Plainly, the Russians in the tank were more interested in just getting through to the south than in spoiling our attack. A few Russian tanks in the portion of the pocket to the left and right of us were still firing arbitrarily. They were captured later because even Ivan could only drive along the trails and the corduroy roads. A breakthrough to the south was thus denied to him. When we reached the place where the forward elements had turned off to the east, I left two vehicles to pull security. I personally drove back to the plane to reinforce the defensive perimeter. The forward elements had reached their objective without large losses. The situation made us realise how fortunate we were to have such good cartographic materials. Because of this, we were easily able to find every trail and clearing. That never would have been possible on a normal map. Up until that point, everything had gone reasonably well. We would have been happy, however, if we had already made it through the night. It was clear to everyone that the Russians would try to counter-attack us. At the onset of darkness, two of our patrols left to establish contact to the east and west. The night from April 6th to 7, 1944, was probably one of the worst ones of the entire war for all of us. We were right in the middle of the Russians and didn't know whether they would cut off our way back. Our APCs had driven back during the day to fetch the winter clothing. During the night, they had to bring ammunition and rations up front. That was a more than difficult mission, which demanded courage, stamina, and an extraordinary sense of duty. The men had to box their way through again and again, first to the north and then to the south. The Russians did everything to block their path. Many APCs fell victim to the exposed mines. The route could only be kept open thanks to the courage of Graf Strachwitz's aide, Lieutenant Gunther Famula, who had been assigned this difficult mission. On April 22nd, Famula was killed by a bomb dropped from a Russian airplane during our next operation at Kriwasu. He was never able to wear the Knight's Cross, which was awarded to him on May 15th. The Russians attacked our defensive perimeter with strong forces from all sides. The forces cut off by us in the north attempted to break out to the south. From the south, Ivan conducted vigorous relief attacks to destroy us 
and maintain his forward positions. It was a bitter night for the battalion. It was under heavy fire from the enemy the entire night and suffered heavy losses. The seriously wounded were transported to the rear in APCs. The slightly wounded preferred to stay with us. Our Stuka squadrons brought us hardly any relief because they couldn't drop their bombs right next to us. Besides, the heavy things would sink so far into the marshy ground that they made large craters but caused little damage. The Russians had also concentrated so many anti-aircraft guns, primarily rapid-fire weapons, that it was impossible for our Stukas to dive low enough. The times when our Stukas were able to demoralise the enemy were long gone. The forward observers of the artillery units helped us the most. They were able to give us some breathing space occasionally due to their superbly directed fire. We hardly believed it when morning finally came and we were still alive. Ivan still hadn't given up his efforts to dislodge us, but everything looked different with the onset of daylight. The oppressive darkness, in which you could identify neither friend nor foe, was gone. We could see who was in front of us again. During the morning, the ground began to soften up under the influence of the April sun. Soon our tanks had sunk so deeply into the marshy ground that they were practically sitting on their hulls. We just managed to get to the trail and set up security there. The first elements of the infantry regiment then came forward and occupied the new front lines. The rest combed the pocket from north to south. One of our tanks, Wesley's, had been hit the previous evening right at the fork in the road. A heavy artillery round had crippled him, and he sat helpless in the open, exposed to possible attacks by Russian patrols. Our commander had driven back to the Kinderheim during the evening. I called Shotrov several times and told him that he needed to tow Vesely. Von Schiller was once again not in his tank and also didn't return after some time. I finally went myself and freed Weasley from his miserable situation. We could scarcely recognise the commander and the men of the Fusilier battalion who had survived the hell of the past few days. They appeared to have been aged by years. We were withdrawn at the conclusion of the operation. We then drove back along the Rollbahn towards Silomar. Well beyond the front, a Russian observation balloon observed the ridgeline that the road crossed. It was well known that the Russians immediately opened fire at any movement along the roads. I gave the express order that hatches were to be closed in this sector, or, at the very least, that heads had to be kept in the tank. Feldwebel Link didn't bother with that, and was exposed down to the belt buckle in his cupola. Three tanks had already gone by the high ground when the first salvo landed to the right and left of the roll barn. At the same moment, I saw Link collapse into the turret, looking like he had been struck by lightning. Because the tank didn't stop, I brought it to a halt by radio. The crew hadn't noticed that its commander had been seriously wounded. We attempted to pull him out of the turret, but he cried out in pain as if we wanted to tear him in pieces. A large piece of shrapnel had penetrated through the hip and ripped open all of one side. He looked terrible, and we were afraid that we would not be able to bring him to the field hospital alive. To our relief, the doctor determined that no vital organs had been hit. After a few weeks, we received the news that Link had gone on convalescent leave. Once again we had got off easy, but these unnecessary casualties always upset me more than any heavy combat. We finally had a few days of rest and were able to get our damaged vehicles back in shape. One morning we received a surprise visit from a vehicle from the public radio section of a propaganda company. These folks had the mission of recording our defensive fighting of March 17th. This was to occur in an authentic manner on wax records. At first all sorts of stories were told until the electrician had laid a wire from the commander's tank into our room. It connected the radio in the tank with the recording device next to us. When everything finally worked, I had to get into the tank while the propaganda man took the place of the radio operator. The drama was ready to begin. I had to give a semblance of the radio traffic and orders that I had given out on the day of the battle. Of course, fire commands and similar things were also given. Von Schiller sat in the room and played my partner as the company commander. After all, he had been named in the Wehrmacht Daily Report. The front-line report needed to refer to that. When I had enough of this gruesome game, we called it quits. The record was played back right away, 
but it did not find approval under the demanding eyes of the experts. We had to repeat everything once again. At certain intervals, the propaganda man gave his fantasy-filled description of the events. In a realistic fashion, he portrayed how the tanks were burning, how they fired, how they were hit, and how all hell was breaking loose everywhere. The second recording finally met with approval. Then a few comrades who had record players at home were allowed to make a recording as a sort of letter. It was sent to the folks back home. No one recognised his own voice any more when the record was played back. Only the text revealed who had actually spoken. In general, these propaganda guys weren't to our liking. By that, it shouldn't be inferred there weren't terrific guys among them who took their job seriously and were also good soldiers to boot. But exceptions prove the rule. Usually they were strange types who showed up dressed as soldiers in their pseudo-officer uniforms. This hybrid between not-quite-soldier and not-quite-civilian was very unfortunate. Besides, we saw most of the propaganda men as the darlings of the propaganda ministry. They only viewed the war as a pleasant change of pace. They were also allowed all sorts of preferential treatment compared to the foot-soldier at the front. That was why we enjoyed the exceptions, as I already noted, even more so. Unfortunately, there were some among them who gave their life for their country. We heard our propaganda report a few days later during the normal radio programme. We were amazed at how well the sounds of battle had been added in Berlin. We could barely understand our own voices for all the shooting going on. For that reason, the report unleashed all sorts of laughter among us. After that experience, we never again took a report from the front seriously. When our guests departed, I was supposed to sign a paper certifying that the propaganda man who filed the report had sat in my tank. I left this to the company commander, who could do that with a clear conscience. It was, after all, his tank in which the story had taken place. It didn't become clear to us what great good fortune we had until the operation was a success, particularly after the prisoners had been interrogated. Among other officers, our advance guard had taken prisoner the operations officer of the division in the East Sack. The rapidly advancing tanks of the Gross Deutschland division had reached the division command post located at the base of the pocket so quickly that the Russian divisional commander still hadn't received any word of our breakthrough. All the lines had been broken during the preparatory fire. The surprised operations officer was still only in his shirt upon our arrival and had to dress quickly in order to be taken captive. The Russian general, it should be noted, had already taken off for the south. We discovered through our prisoners that an entire Russian division had been assembled in the pocket, equipped with a lot of heavy weapons. The Russians hadn't considered such a catastrophe possible. The remainder of their tank brigade, which had already suffered considerably in the previous defensive fighting, was likewise still in the marshy woods, where it had no manoeuvre room at all. It fell into our hands without a scratch. The interrogation of the Russian captain was very informative. It should be noted that he made a superior impression, even in his clothing. I saw that the Russians had returned to the wide shoulder boards that had been forbidden for a while. Medals were also awarded and worn again. The other side had also come to the conclusion that soldiers place value on being able to show their combat skills to the outside world by the wearing of awards. Based on the statements of the Russian captain, our attack had come as a complete surprise to them. They had never expected a frontal assault from the north. They thought that the northern front at Lembitu had been fortified so well that nothing could happen to it by any stretch of the imagination. I also wouldn't have wanted to experience what would have happened had we gotten stuck at the railway embankment and the ten Russian anti-tank positions had been occupied. The Russians had expected our attack along the bottom of the sack from the east and west. That was the shortest route, and the west sack had also been liquidated in this fashion. To avoid the repetition of such a disaster, the Russian lines on both sides of the bottom of the sack had been mined in all sorts of tricky ways. Even the trees had been connected with trip wires. No infantryman would have been able to get through there in one piece, regardless of whether he walked, stooped or crawled on the ground but this mining proved fateful to the Russians themselves. After our breakthrough, they were no longer able to break out to the side and withdraw. 
The Russians cursed their commissars as much as we did our own Nazi political officers. They were also becoming an increasing nuisance to us at the front. They usually hung around division headquarters, however. We only noticed their presence through the circulars that were occasionally sent to the frontline units. Politics didn't play any role at all for those of us at the front. It would have appeared idiotic to me if I had said Heil Hitler to my men during morning formation. After all, the most varied types of people were thrown together in the same struggle and subject to the same harsh laws. There were Nazis and opponents of the regime, as well as completely disinterested parties. They were united in comradeship. It was completely unimportant whether one did his job for the Führer or for his country, or out of a sense of duty. The political or non-political opinions of the others didn't interest anyone. The main thing was that he was a good comrade and a halfway decent soldier. If that was true, then everything worked out. After all the difficulties that lay behind us, we enjoyed our breather in Silamai to its fullest. But something pulled me back to the sight of the carnage. I wanted to see it one more time in a more peaceful atmosphere. So I left on the spur of the moment in my Kubel and paid a visit to the former East Sack. Since I didn't have to concentrate on the enemy any more, I realised how ghastly the terrain appeared that had been so bitterly and continuously contested for the previous few weeks. As I drove back in the darkness, my flesh crawled. The air was still full of the stink that burned out tanks always left behind. The materiel of the Russians lay scattered all over the place. On the plain, I found a Russian tank turret all by itself. It had survived all the artillery fire. At the beginning of the fighting, we had knocked out this Russian tank. The turret had been ripped off the hull by the explosion and flew through the air. We ducked our heads, and in fact the turret didn't land too far from us. The cannon bored into the marshy ground almost up to the gun mantlet, while the turret jutted upright as if on a stick. Almost all the trees in the woods south of the railway embankment were charred black and shot to pieces. It created a ghostly impression, as if all life had completely died out. Not a single living creature was to be seen in these dead woods. The birds had withdrawn after all of nature had been trampled on by humans. It was always interesting for us to see how well the Russians were capable of constructing positions even under the most difficult circumstances. The artillery pieces and the mortars had been built up on corduroy stands and completely protected by beams against shrapnel. No human could dig in deeply in that marshy terrain. The shallow Russian bunkers, if that's what one wants to call their dugouts, actually protected against the fire of heavy weapons unless they received a direct hit. We were able to determine that all the Russians who had been in their provisional bunkers had gotten off with a good scare. Even the connecting trenches between the rail crossing and our former eastward strongpoint had been constructed in an exemplary fashion. This showed me that it was possible to dig in quickly, despite frost and marshy terrain. Our regimental commander had considered this impossible. Strongpoints without heavy weapons and without contact with one another will always be lost whenever a massed attack starts. The man dug into the ground has already been psychologically prevented from giving his best. He finds himself in constant fear that he may not be able to get out of his foxhole during an enemy breakthrough because he is a goner in the open. Therefore, he will logically do what our guys did when the Russians penetrated. He will attempt to get to safety during the artillery barrage dot in praise of the tiger. In my book so far, there has been much talk about knocking out tanks and the destruction of Russian anti-tank guns. This portrayal could create the impression that to a certain extent these successes were child's play. If that is the case, then this book has been misunderstood. The paramount mission of an armour unit is the engagement and destruction of enemy tanks and anti-tank weapons. The psychological support of the infantry during covering missions is only of secondary importance. There was no such thing as a life insurance policy in a tank, and there can't be any. Our Tiger was the most ideal tank, however, that I was acquainted with. It probably hasn't been surpassed, even by the current state of weaponry. In any case, that certainly applies to the West. The Russians could possibly surprise us with new designs. The strength of a tank lies in its armour, its mobility, and, finally, in its armament. 
These three factors have to be weighed against each other so that a maximum in performance is achieved. This ideal appeared to be realised in our Tiger. The 88mm cannon was good enough to defeat every tank, assuming that you hit it in the right place. Our Tigers were strong enough up front to withstand a few rounds. We couldn't afford to let ourselves be hit on the side, in the rear, or, especially, on top. Just that alone required a lot of prudence and experience. Our guidelines were, shoot first, but if you can't do that, at least hit first. The prerequisite for that, of course, is fully functioning communications from tank to tank and also among the crew. Furthermore, quick and accurate gun laying systems need to be present. In most instances, the Russians lacked both of these prerequisites. Because of that, they often came out on the short end of the stick even though they frequently didn't lag behind us in armour, weapons and manoeuvrability. With the Stalin tanks, they were even superior to us. The most important consideration came after all the material conditions were filled. The personal aggressiveness of the commander while observing was decisive for success against numerically vastly superior enemy formations. The lack of good observation by the Russians often resulted in the defeat of large units, Tank commanders who slam their hatches shut at the beginning of an attack and don't open them again until the objective has been reached are useless, or at least second-rate. There are, of course, six to eight vision blocks mounted in a circle in every cupola that allow observation. But they are only good for a certain sector of the terrain, limited by the size of the individual vision block. If the commander is looking through the left vision block when an anti-tank gun opens fire from the right, then he will need a long time before he identifies it from inside the buttoned-up tank. Unfortunately, impacting rounds are felt before the sound of the enemy gun's report, because the speed of the round is greater than the speed of sound. Therefore, a tank commander's eyes are more important than his ears. As a result of rounds exploding in the vicinity, one doesn't hear the gun's report at all in the tank. It is quite different whenever the tank commander raises his head occasionally in an open hatch to survey the terrain. If he happens to look halfway to the left while an enemy anti-tank gun opens fire halfway to the right, his eye will subconsciously catch the shimmer of the yellow muzzle flash. His attention will immediately be directed toward the new direction and the target will usually be identified in time. Everything depends on the prompt identification of a dangerous target, Usually, seconds decide. What I said above also applies to tanks that have been equipped with a periscope. The destruction of an anti-tank gun was often accepted as nothing special by lay people and soldiers from other branches. Only the destruction of other tanks counted as a success. On the other hand, anti-tank guns counted twice as much to the experienced tanker. They were much more dangerous to us. The anti-tank cannon waited in ambush, well camouflaged, and magnificently set up in the terrain. Because of that, it was very difficult to identify. It was also very difficult to hit because of its low height. Usually we didn't make out the anti-tank guns until they had fired the first shot. We were often hit right away if the anti-tank crew was on top of things because we had run into a wall of anti-tank guns, it was then advisable to keep as cool as possible and take care of the enemy before the second aimed shot was fired. No one can deny that the many casualties among the officers and other tank commanders were due to exposing their heads. But these men didn't die in vain. If they had moved with closed hatches, then many more men would have found their death or been severely wounded inside the tanks. The large Russian tank losses are proof of the correctness of this assertion. Fortunately for us, they almost always drove cross-country buttoned up. Of course, every tank commander had to be careful while peering out during positional warfare, especially since the turret hatches of tanks in the front lines were continuously watched by enemy sharpshooters. Even a short exposure could be fatal for the tank commander. I had commandeered a folding artillery scope for just such cases. Actually, such a scope shouldn't be missing in any fighting vehicle. For a long time, the Russians had only four-man crews. The commander had to observe, aim and fire all at the same time. Because of that, they were always inferior to an enemy who divided these important functions between two men. Shortly after the beginning of the war, the Russians had recognised the advantages of a five-man crew. They eventually redesigned their tanks, 
adding a cupola on the turret and a commander's station. I have never quite understood why, for example, the English developed a new heavy tank after the war that was only crewed by four men. We were completely satisfied with our Tigers, and our infantry no less so. After all, we had stood our ground with them during all the difficult defensive fighting in the East and West. Many a tanker owes a debt of gratitude to this first-rate tank. He survived to enjoy a peaceful existence nowadays. Failure and farewell. The objective of a new operation that was planned was to eliminate the remaining Russian bridgehead. Its depth from north to south was almost twice that of both portions of the bridgehead already wiped out. On April 15, 1944, we were once again ordered to a meeting with the Graf. The subject matter was preparations for the third Operation Strachwitz. Although we were already familiar with his leadership methods to a certain extent, his careful, methodical planning amazed us once again. When he entered his command post, where we had all assembled, he sized us up once again with that somewhat caustic glance of his. After he had put aside his cap and walking stick, he stepped up to the map table. Very well, gentlemen. This time we want to eliminate the remainder of the Russian bridgehead, which sits like a thorn in our sides. Its depth, as you know, is almost twice that of both portions of the bridgehead we wiped out. But that shouldn't bother us. The Kampfgruppe that will be assembled for this operation has the same strength and organisation as the one for our affair in the East Sack. You gentlemen know one another already. That will make some things easier. While saying this, the Oberst pointed to the map. We will assemble in this piece of woods. To get to it, you'll have to turn south from the roll barn east of the Kinderheim. Our own front lines, about two kilometres from the assembly area, will be crossed during the preparatory fire. They will be crossed at the point where they run from north to south along the side of the bridgehead. The Russian front lines will be broken violently in one continuous advance. I will now ask you to follow all additional information on the maps, which were handed out to you at the beginning of the conference. These maps are photocopies of the aerial photography taken of the area of operations. They turned out first-rate and put our other map material to shame. The first battle objective is point 312. You can see how the road turns at a 90-degree angle to the south at that point. From then on, it runs in a practically straight line until it reaches the Narwa at a larger village. The trail from the north that joins into our avenue of approach at this bend will be secured by the lead element until the rest of the Kampfgruppe has passed point 312 heading south. The Kampfgruppe will thrust to the Narwa, it will occupy and hold the aforementioned village until the bridgehead has been split by other units into individual sectors and eliminated. At the same time, a second Kampfgruppe will advance south along the axis kinderheim Bootsoul. It will then follow this trail east and reach the axis of advance using that. A third Kampfgruppe has the mission to penetrate the enemy lines 1,500 metres south of and parallel to that trail. As you see, there is a low-lying wooded ridge line running east to west between this Kampfgruppe and you. That's the plan of attack so far. The Graf stopped for a moment and looked at us in succession. Since we didn't have any questions at that point, he continued, Looked at superficially, this operation is very similar to both of our previous ones, only this time there are probably going to be considerably more difficulties. Mark my words, the basic object has not changed. You still have to advance without stopping. You must reach the Nawa without the Russians being able to gather their wits. It is undoubtedly clear to all of you that you cannot reach your objective if, for some reason, the lead elements should come to a standstill. That's the entire problem for the Tigers. There is marsh to the right and left of your avenue of approach. Therefore, you can't deviate from the trail. Moreover, the trail is also only wide enough for one of your Tigers to be able to drive on it without problems. The only advantage that you have compared to the previous operations is that the road is somewhat elevated and has a good foundation. From point 312 onward, it proceeds through a reasonably tall set of marshy woods, which extends to the Nawa. For us tankers, it is something completely and singularly undesired, but we can't change that at all. 
How far we will be able to get with keeping everything a secret this time is another question. We have already surprised the Russians twice in their bridgehead. They know that this bridgehead is a pain for us. A third surprise will therefore probably not be possible, especially since they know that a new attack can only be carried out on this road. This naturally diminishes our chances of success compared to the previous operations where we were successful in using the element of surprise. Fortunately, we also know a few things. According to prisoner statements, the trail from the Russian front lines to point 312 has been mined. Ivan has packed the culverts in the road embankment full of explosives. These are located about every 30 metres. He can ignite these demo chambers all at once from a bunker, which is, as you can see, in the woods somewhat east of point 312. We want to try to counteract the danger of everything being blown. During the preparatory fire, we will fire an entire battalion of 280mm artillery just at this bunker. This will undoubtedly cut the demo lines, and the route will remain negotiable. To provide cover for the lead elements, a platoon of combat engineers will follow the Tigers. After the breakthrough, it will advance in the ditches to the right and left of the trail. It will cut the lines that lead to the demo chambers. It's better to be safe than sorry. Besides, it must be assumed that the Russians probably won't ignite the charges until the tanks are on the mined sections. Otherwise, their preparations don't make any sense. If, contrary to our expectations, the lines are still intact despite the artillery fire, then the engineers can still prevent their demolition in a timely fashion. What's going on? Reluctantly, the Graf turned to his adjutant, who had just entered the room, flushed with excitement. The officer straightened up. Herr Graf, I would like to report that the announcement has been made in the news that the Führer had awarded you the diamonds to the Knight's Cross. If I may take the liberty, I would like to be the first one to congratulate you. We were also extremely happy about the award, and wanted to congratulate him ourselves. Likewise, we wanted to celebrate this honour in a suitable manner. After all, we had also contributed quite a bit to it. Before we were able to say a word, however, the graph made an abrupt sign of disapproval. First, the news is not an official source of information. Second, I don't have any time for that now and don't wish to be disturbed again. That was meant for the adjutant, who turned beet red. He raised his hand to his cap and disappeared rapidly. The oberst then turned back to us as if nothing had happened. Behind the Russian lines, there is still a knocked-out T-34 along the route of advance. It can be clearly identified in the aerial photo. In my opinion, it blocks the road and must be removed. To accomplish this, an APC with engineers will follow behind the second Tiger. They will blow the wreck out of the way with prepared charges. Did you want to say something, Carius? Yes, Herr Graf. There is a ditch in front of the T-34 behind the Russian lines. It, too, can be clearly identified in the aerial photo. A wooden bridge used to cross this ditch. It has since been removed. Only a small footbridge can be seen in its place. Naturally, our tigers can't go over it. The wooden bridge with its small span would have held a tiger, but the footbridge... The Graf interrupted me. You'll also get over this ridiculous ditch without a bridge? With all due respect, no, Herr Graf. I still know this area from the time when the Russians hadn't yet advanced so far, and they were just getting ready to infiltrate across the Narwa. Back then, of course, I studied the terrain intensely. Because even if the ditch isn't an obstacle for infantry, for tanks, it is. The Graf had placed his hands in his pants pockets and looked at me with interest. Because of his gaze, I hesitated for a moment in my explanation. He drew up the corner of his mouth and then repeated in his haughty manner, For tanks it is? The question mark was not to be ignored. I pulled myself together. This is what I mean, Herr Graf. The area surrounding the ditch is completely marshy. Getting over it without a bridge is something completely impossible. Besides that, you can see quite clearly from the aerial photo that the ditch has been cut to have steep sides. That tells us that the Russians have quite intentionally created an obstacle. They have made this ditch in the marshy terrain into an anti-tank ditch. Quite simply, it is an obstacle, and it is also intended to be one. I hadn't held back with my opinion. 
I considered it to be my duty to my comrades to surface my doubts here. After all, if anyone were to get stuck in this damned ditch, it would be us and not the graf. I looked him straight in the eyes, unflinchingly, but not insolently, as the regulation puts it so nicely. The oberst took his right hand out of his pocket and moved it along the ditch on the map. Take note of this, Carius, he said in a friendly manner. If I say that this ditch doesn't exist as an anti-tank ditch to me, then it doesn't exist. Do we understand each other? In my entire military career, I had never experienced such an elegant and at the same time unmistakable rebuff. Graf Strachwitz didn't want to see an anti-tank ditch, so there was none there. Period. End of discussion. I was so nonplussed by that that I could only choke out a short, Yes, sir. Still smiling in his slightly caustic manner, the oberst nodded and continued his briefing. The other officers had also piped up and asked their questions, none of which remained unanswered. After the meeting, when no one said anything following the usual, any more questions, the graph turned to me one more time. I've thought about the matter one more time, Carius. Do you still foresee difficulties with the ditch? Yes, Herr Graf. Well, I don't want to spoil your fun, especially not when there really could be something to the matter. Do you have a suggestion? I believe that wooden beams should be set aside and brought forward in APCs at the right moment. We can then lay these beams over the ditch, which would only cause a minor delay. Graf Strachwitz nodded. Approved, he said. I will cause the necessary things to happen. He then reached for his walking stick and cap and turned to go. Somehow I got the impression deep inside that even the Oberst didn't quite believe in the success of the plan just discussed. He himself would have preferred to call off the entire affair. The preparatory measures corresponded in scope to those that had been taken for the previous operations under the Graf. Our fighters from Rival ensured absolute air superiority. Our Stuka comrades had the difficult mission of destroying the main bridge and both of the pontoon bridges that had been built by the Russians over the Nawa. This was intended to cut off supplies in the bridgehead and to prevent the enemy from falling back over the river. Without a doubt, the entire concept was tremendous, the preparations magnificent, and the organisation excellent. Despite that, we thought our chances were quite slim. That may not sound logical. One must not forget, however, that we had enjoyed amazing luck and the advantage of surprise during the first two Strachwitz operations. But no one dared to hope for the luck we needed for the new operation. We knew that if we actually made it to the Nawa in accordance with the plan, we would then be sitting in a trap in the midst of the Russians. They would have the understandable desire to hold the bridgehead at all costs. Ivan would only have to close the door behind us, and no one would get out again. An assault gun or a tank set up behind us on the road would make every forward or rearward movement impossible. We thus drove back to Silama with mixed feelings. We briefed the tank commanders on the new plan. Von Schiller insisted that he lead the forward elements. I tried in vain to dissuade him. He probably wanted to prove to all of us that the bad opinion of him was wrong. But somehow he had picked out the one operation that was almost hopeless, no one else could have been successful either. It was to be his last operation with the company. According to plan, we reached our assembly area in the early morning hours of April 19th. The Russians kept both exceptionally and suspiciously still. We expected an artillery attack at any moment on our piece of woods. Ivan could easily see into them. He also must have heard us, since the area was quite level. Strange. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. Those guys had most likely been armed to the teeth and just wanted to take a look at us from close up. That was my firm belief. Graf Strachwitz had ordered his command post built in this piece of woods. The drivers of the APCs with our breaching beams were also in the bunkers. They would wait there until they were called forward to supply us if needed. The other APCs were in line on the road with the Panzer the Fours of their regiment. They were participating in the breakthrough and transporting the infantry. They were mixed in behind our eight Tigers. An APC was located behind the second Tiger of the lead group. It was bringing our engineers forward and also had to take along the forward observer of the artillery. 
A squad of infantry was attached to each of my four tigers. They were already standing on the tanks and checking out how they could best make themselves small behind the turret and hold on. It was probably still about ten minutes before the beginning of the attack. I was walking down the column to see whether everything was all right. It was then, at the last minute, that we had an unfortunate incident, which served as an ominous omen. I had barely gone fifty metres to the rear when, with a start, I heard a machine-gun salvo behind me. I knew right away that someone overly anxious had already loaded. A few rounds had gone off on the unlucky guy. I almost had a heart attack when I realised that this had happened to my loader, of all people. Bad luck seldom travels alone. He had also depressed the weapon so that two infantrymen on the tiger in front of me were severely wounded. Naturally, our comrades in the Fusilier Battalion were besides themselves, and their confidence in us was shaken to the core. The wounded were quickly evacuated in an APC because the attack was supposed to begin. If Ivan really hadn't noticed anything up until that point, then everything must have been clear to him after that incident. The matter continued to bother me throughout the operation, but there wasn't anything else that could be done about it then. I just couldn't understand how such a thing had happened to such an old hand. It should be noted that it was strictly forbidden to load or even depress weapons before the attack was rolling, and a clear field of fire was present. In the assembly area shortly before H hour, only the radio operators were allowed to tune in their equipment. Everything else had to wait. And it was on that morning, of all mornings, that we would have had many hours of time to load our weapons. We would soon find that out. Naturally, my loader was virtually useless that day. I also had it up to the chin line. Later on, we were only able to avoid a court-martial with great difficulty. Who would have benefited from a conviction of the unfortunate fellow? Although the cause of the accident had been wear on the breach of the machine gun, the loader's guilt was indisputable, if for no other reason than that the weapons should have been elevated. The gunner would also have been charged because he had not exercised his supervisory duty. I was extremely happy that I avoided punishment for both of them. Despite everything, the attack rolled on time. Our point had just crossed the front line when the column unexpectedly came to a halt. After some time had elapsed, information was passed on the radio that the lead tank had run onto a mine and was immobile. The attack thus came to a standstill, and it was clear to me that we would never reach the Nawa. We then waited in completely open terrain, a good target. Ivan had already started to show signs of life. He was firing with artillery and mortars of every calibre, and had also alarmed his close air support. Fortunately, our fighters were at least able to keep the skies clear, shooting down two Russian ground-attack planes. The others didn't come too close after that. Three Russian observation balloons floated over the bridgehead, directing the heavy artillery. We didn't receive a single direct hit, even though we were there for hours on end. Our ability to move forward and backward was limited because we couldn't leave the road. This proved how difficult it is to render a tank harmless at great distances, even with directed fire. In some respects, the Russians are magicians. It was amazing how quickly the balloons disappeared onto the ground whenever a German fighter approached. Those guys were up in the air again just as quickly. Our fighters couldn't approach at low level because the Russians employed countless anti-aircraft weapons. These weapons, especially the twin and quad light cannons, laid down a terrific wall of fire whenever the fighters appeared. The Stukas, which attacked the Nawa bridgehead during the day, suffered the same fate as the fighters. It was hard enough to hit a bridge in a steep dive. It was impossible there because the bombs had to be dropped at high altitudes. Two of our machines were even shot down by the Russian anti-aircraft weapons. Later, we found out that the bridges constructed by the engineers were scarcely detectable from the air. They ran just under the water's surface. One could only identify them by the slight agitation of the water. Such underwater bridges could not be approached from the air, let alone be hit. In any case, Ivan hadn't been sleeping, and his defensive measures presented us with an unsolvable problem. The other two attack groups had also become as stuck as we were. The group that had attacked out of the former boot wasn't able to use a single reinforced road. The Panzer IVs soon became stuck in the mud. 
During our orders conference, we had joked that the Graf wanted to report the elimination of the Nawa bridgehead to the Führer as a birthday present on April 20th. After just a few hours, the entire affair already bore very little resemblance to a birthday present. Our Stukas dropped bombs several times on the ridge farther to the south and around point 312. Perhaps these attacks had a psychological effect, but no serious damage was inflicted upon the enemy. The smoke had scarcely dissipated when the Russians came back to life. The company commander, von Schiller, remained quiet in his tank, without trying to do anything. At regular intervals, Graf Strachwitz inquired about the situation, receiving the same answer each time. Location unchanged, forward advance impossible. We held out until about noon in this manner, but then the Graf lost his patience. Von Schiller and I were ordered back to the command post. Of course, I couldn't imagine anything good happening and made my way on foot with the commander. We finally reached the command post, more crawling than walking. Graf Strachwitz was already awaiting us in front of his bunker, nervously swinging his customary walking stick. Then he let loose. Von Schiller, I am shocked. You didn't give a single order the entire time. I think you would still be at the same spot tomorrow without having done anything. I have to demand somewhat more personal initiative from the commander of a tiger company. This is really incredible. Simply close your hatches and wait until the situation clears up by itself. I will investigate the matter and then take appropriate action. The Graf finished off von Schiller in this manner. Strachwitz was beside himself with rage and was scarcely able to stop. He then gave me the order to assume the welcome mission and put the completely derailed operation back on track. He announced he would soon visit the lead elements. You haven't seen anything yet, he said, if I personally have to get the entire affair rolling again. With mixed feelings, I made my way back to the front. I informed the men by radio that command had been transferred to me. Unteroffizier Carpanetto, who, as the lead tank, had suffered misfortune with the mine, then immediately attempted to move his vehicle to the right and into the marsh using his one track. I helped push him a little from behind, and then got past him without problems. Of course, we could have executed the same manoeuvre during the morning, but Carpanetto had not moved because von Schiller had not made an effort to get past him. Carpanetto couldn't stand the commander at all and had probably waited a long time to do him in. The incident with the mine helped him do that. One could possibly characterise his obstinate waiting for an order as unsoldierly or not in the spirit of comradeship, but in the long run he saved all of us with his stubbornness and dislike of von Schiller. Even with a speedy advance, there was no doubt that Ivan would have finished us off that time. Unteroffizier Alfredo Capanetto was an academy-trained painter from Vienna. He was a daredevil and a fabulous tank commander and comrade. One could do anything with him, provided one had his trust and confidence. As one could imagine, he wasn't born for parade ground drill and ceremony. He cut a less than imposing figure on the drill field. One could never have made a Prussian out of him, but his soldierly attitude and his unconditional comradeship weren't too far removed from the real Prussian spirit of old. That type of man always tried to get the goat of people like von Schiller. I therefore couldn't understand why Otto Carius, in dress uniform and wearing the knight's cross with oak leaves, was commanding such a unit. The author's first tiger is pictured with Oberfeldwebel Rudolf Zwetti's tiger and his crew. The tank was still in factory finish and missing the first outer road wheel. During this time, the heavy companies of the battalions had Panzer threes and IVs. The first prisoners were collected in the vicinity of Vilna. This shot is taken from the viewpoint of a Panzer II, a vehicle present in the battalion combat reconnaissance platoon. The advance continued. A typical roll barn can be seen here, where a maintenance halt was conducted with all of the vehicles nose to tail. Since the 1st Battalion was following the lead battalion, there was little to no danger to these vehicles. Note that all the armoured vehicle crewmen wore one-piece overalls over their black panzer uniforms. A 37mm Puck gun from the anti-tank platoon of the 1st Battalion headquarters usually worked closely with the trains, providing them protection. The effect of a roll on the author's tank can be seen here. 
The radio operator lost an arm due to the penetration, while the author suffered some teeth and flesh wounds. An abandoned Russian anti-aircraft gun in Orsha on the Dnieper in July 1941 marks a significant moment in our campaign. Attempts were made to camouflage vehicles during rest halts, but in the wide open spaces of Russia this could be a difficult undertaking. We were extremely happy when it became dark. As usual, the Russian bomber formations flew past us and bombarded the city of Nawa and our bridgehead dot. The city had probably already been levelled to the ground. Whenever the fires lit up the evening sky to our rear, we could hardly believe that there was still anything flammable left. The night was so dark that we couldn't see our hands in front of our eyes. I had a portion of the crews dismount with their machine pistols so that they could provide cover to the left and right of the road a short distance away. Ivan would have been able to easily surprise us in the tanks since we couldn't see his approach. With Kersher and Zweti, I went back to the assembly area where our supply staff brought up munitions, fuel and food. From that point on, the troops were supplied by APs. The can-do attitude of these men from Grobe Deutschland and their leader, Lieutenant Famula, was magnificent. No matter how often I went to their bunker with a request during those nights, I never heard anyone curse when he was torn away from his sleep and once again had to drive to us up front. Kersher brought the munitions and fuel up front, based on the reported needs of the individual tanks. I followed with the engineer squad, which had loaded the beams for the anti-tank ditch. The Russians were scarcely firing their heavy weapons any more. An occasional machine gun to the right and left of the road could be heard. Wild confusion reigned behind the Russian lines as far forward as the anti-tank ditch. Ivan was exploring the area with numerous reconnaissance patrols. Often we yelled at someone who was standing in our way and didn't realise it was a Russian until he took off. Of course, none of us let himself get involved in a firefight, but despite that, or perhaps because of it, the night was especially unnerving. The Russians must have been interested in snatching one of us, and this certainty sufficed for us to practice the greatest of caution.